invite you this morning to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, we'll begin our reading at verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help fit for him. And out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help fit for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he, God, took one of his ribs, or side, and clothed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Let's pray, please. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we have before us this morning this glorious passage of Scripture. I thank you for it. Help us to, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to interpret it correctly. Help us to have pure hearts, because it is only as we have purity of mind and heart that we can understand and then do your will. And so bless these moments together, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Today, we celebrate Mother's Day. And so, of course, it is appropriate for the preacher to speak on mothers or something relating to mothers. And so what I would like us to do today is to basically honor our mothers. And the way I would like to do that is to broaden the discussion and relate mothers to fathers and mothers, to the family, to the marriage of mother and father. Mothers, of course, being an integral part. I hasten to say that there are some of us in our group whose marriages may not be as it is set forth here. I acknowledge that. And if you think that I'm trying to point a finger at you in terms of your particular relationship today, I'm not. I am trying only to remind all of us of the sacredness of biblical Christian marriage. What is biblical Christian marriage? President McKinley loved his mother. She lived in Ohio somewhere, and she was aged, was sick, and he had a special train lined up to, to head in that direction. He got word that she was not doing well, and so he sent a message somehow to her saying, I'll be there. I'll be there. Somehow that message uh, got uh, communicated here and, and yonder. And someone by the name of Charles Fillimore, a hymn writer, picked up that little phrase and wrote a little song. We know it well. It goes, the words go like this. Tell mother I'll be there. In answer to her prayer, this message, blessed Savior, to her. Please bear. Tell mother I'll be there. Heaven's joys with her to share. 
Yes, tell darling mother I'll be there. Evidently, that particular song, particularly during the war years when sung in the presence of military men, led many to a saving knowledge of Christ. But it's a wonderful song. Tell mother I'll be there in answer to her prayer. Heaven's joys with her to share. What I would like to do to say with your permission, I'm going to say with your permission or not, I'm going to do it. I'm going to talk to my mother and share some blessings. Now, dear mother, I understand you're not here on planet Earth. You're there. You left us at the age of 56. Uh, you were dad. You're looking down at us today, dear mom. I want to tell you something. I'll tell you I love you, mama. Uh, you can see me today preaching from this pulpit. Uh, this little village. Beautiful little church. Well-maintained, wonderful people. Uh, you, you're probably happy with that. I'm sure you are. You also know I live in a little house in Kershaw, which we, it's a little cottage, we love it, we love it. Very comfortable. The little village of Kershaw yesterday, they had a spring festival. It was fun to be there. I met a shopkeeper who said that they dwindled down over the years, not too many people. There was a, a choir singing, some school children, and I have to admit to you, it sounded like a bunch of cats. Uh, I have to be honest, I mean, you, you know what's going on. I'm here because of you, dear mom. But I really don't want to spend too much time talking about, because you know everything. What I would like us to do is to think about this blessedness of Christian marriage, because I know that you, in the presence of Almighty God, are, and you, you know so much more than me, but I would like us to at least confer a little bit and share, because the day will come when heaven's joys with you will share. I'd like to begin that now and have a little blessing with you now as we think about the blessing of God and what he has done for us, particularly in marriage and weddings. We pick up the story in, of course, Genesis. Genesis begins to tell us about the creation of the world. It's a wonderful story. The Bible, of course, is a story of God in eternity past, all the way through to eternity future. But Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Came across just recently a author by the name of William Lyon Phelps, not connected with the swimmer. Evidently, he was well trained in literature, was a professor at Yale University for at least 40 years, a fine, godly Christian man. And he said concerning the first verse of the Bible, concerning the Bible being a wonderful, wonderful piece of literature, the Bible stands so far above any piece of of literature ever in the in humankind it, it's so but this is what he said concerning the first verse he said the narrative opens like a great symphony it's a wonderful story it's a wonderful story and it talks about creation and of course marriage the wedding this particular passage that I read, um, Mom, you know more about it than I do. I'm sorry, but 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to suggest an outline. It may not be exactly like this, but I'm going to suggest it. When I get there, you can correct me. But four parts to this marriage. The marriage design, designed by God. The marriage preparation. The marriage ceremony. And the marriage presentation. The marriage design. We read in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created man in his image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. So in the beginning, God created mankind, humankind, man, God's image, able to communicate with God, have a relationship with God, he can love us and we can love him. We can intellectually talk to him. We can sustain a relationship. We are in his image. Man, mankind is the, is the crown of creation, far higher than the angel, uh, far higher than the, the, the animal kingdom. Mankind is the crown of creation. He made man, male and female. And then in verse 31, he said, it is very, very good. Chapter 1, you have God, Elohim, the creator, creating the cosmos and the animals and, and man. But then specifically in chapter 2, you see the Lord introduced, the Lord God, the Jehovah, the loving, keeping God, connected with God, Elohim, God, the, the loving, kind God, and God, the powerful God. And as we read on here, he creates women. Marriage is God's design. We read in verse 15 of Genesis chapter 2. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. And one of my big beefs is that when God put man in the Garden of Eden, it says he puts the garden is masculine, the it, the tilling it and, 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 and um, uh, keeping it and tilling it is female. They don't go together. Normally in our um, picture story books of creation, you have a gardener, perhaps God gave to man the privilege of being a gardener. Excuse me, Maisie, I know you love gardens. Uh, but the fact, of the, man, the fact of the matter is that God placed man in the Garden of Eden to worship it, meaning God, to serve God. That's the purpose. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the garden the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat thereof. For when you eat it, you will surely die. Then, verse 18, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make an help fit for him. I will make a help fit for him. God's design. Marriage is... God's design. Don't forget that. It's not man's design. It's God's design. Secondly, marriage preparation. We read in verse 19, and out of the ground the Lord God formed every wild beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called them, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the fowl of the air, and to every beast of the field. For Adam 
there was not found and help fit for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man brought he to woman. Preparation particularly seen in verse 22a, and the Lord took a rib which the Lord God had taken and made a woman. Preparation. In every wedding, there are preparations made. The fact of the matter here as we see it is that God took from man out of his side, the rib means side, took flesh and constructed, built a woman. Preparation, prepared a person fit for Adam. It's God's design. God prepared someone for Adam. The ceremony, the ceremony, verse 22b and verse 23, verse 22b, and God made a woman and brought her to the man. And Adam said that this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God brought her to the man. God brought her to the man. Now, I'm going to allow me and I'm going to allow you to use your imagination to think about how God brought the man, the woman, to the man in the ceremony. It doesn't say here how Eve, the woman that was created out of the, the man's side, how this person was brought to Adam but evidently God did it now whether God carried her and said and plumped her here and said here she is or whether God took his arm and I don't know I don't know but just, just be creative and think about a special wedding ceremony where, where God brought the woman to the man isn't that wonderful Back home, Mom. You remember Youth for Christ? I used to be a member of Youth for Christ, and we would go to various camps, and Ted Engstrom, the director of Youth for Christ Worldwide, came to visit. He told us about the fact that the boys liked the girls, and the girls liked the boys. And I remember that, I remember that. And he also told us about this verse. He said, um, God brought the woman to the man. I remember that. I remember that. You also know, Mom, when I left South Africa, I, my friends told me that if I left, I would never come back because I'd be snatched by some young, pretty American doll. I said, no. Never happened to me. You knew I said that, Mom. And I struggled. I struggled. When I was here, I tried. I tried. I wanted to honor. I was snatched. She got me. God brought Linda to me. That's marriage. God brings the woman to us. Read in verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. God gave to Adam the privilege of naming the animals. He must have been a pretty smart cookie, okay? Imagine with me, and I'm just conjecturing now, just excuse my little mind, just kind of, how many, how many plants are there in the world today? How many animals? How many insects? And Adam named them. He must have been pretty intellectually smart. Smarter than anyone I know will ever know. 
And I think as time goes on, mankind, even with our computers and all, are getting dumber and dumber and stupider and stupider. And we know this, I think, because of the fact that in the beginning, uh, God created the world perfect, but after sin, they, mankind would have lived for a long time, but their lifespan got shorter and shorter. Methuselah and some of these people lived for years, but as sin began to encroach, they got shorter and shorter. But here in this passage, he names women saying, and I will say it as gently as I can, there is an order of responsibility and headship. And because Adam named woman gives him the responsibility to be a little bit in terms of leadership over the woman. That's not well received today in our culture, but that's, I believe, the Bible. He said, yes, at the altar. He said, yes, this is my wife, I'm gonna. Then the marriage presentation, the marriage design, the marriage preparation, the marriage ceremony, the marriage presentation. You still listening, Mom, you still with me? The marriage presentation, God speaks, verse 24, therefore, shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And let me go on to verse 25 just briefly to remind us, it says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Sin introduces clothing. I haven't had the opportunity yet but in a mixed company when someone, and I don't know exactly how this would play out, but if someone in that congregation of people would say, Glenn, uh, I don't believe there's sin, or, or discussing what the Bible says, I'll say to the person, whoever he or she may be, well, sir, would you please take off your clothes right now? Unless they are totally depraved and so debauched Normally that would not happen, okay. Clothing represents the fact that we acknowledge sin in the world today, but that's not, that's for another day. Verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto, who said that? I believe God said that. And the reason I say that is I turn to Matthew chapter 19 and verse five, I read. And Jesus said, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Wherefore, they are no more two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Jesus is referring back to this passage it's a very clear identification of the inspiration of Scripture. Jesus is saying Moses wrote it and it's good. He didn't make any mistakes. Our Bible is secure. And in this verse, the Lord says, Who therefore God hath joined together that no man put asunder. So in reference to this verse, therefore, God said, God is the one who constitutes marriage. Marriage is a divine institution, not a civil contract. May I say that one more time? Marriage is a divine institution, not a civil contract. Now, we live in a society, we live in America, we have rules and regulations, but it's for tax purposes and other things. But true biblical marriage is a God-ordained design and institution, and it is God who marries. When a preacher marries someone, he doesn't marry that couple. Who does? It's God. 
It's God who brings the marriage into fruition. Now, just a few minutes thinking about that a little bit. When I married Linda in front of the church altar, I said yes. I said yes to her, and I said yes to the congregation, and I said yes to God. And in my personal, humble opinion, when I said yes to God, that's when I got married. Now we can debate the fine details of exactly that specific pinpoint moment, and I'm not here to, I don't know. Mom, when I get up there, I'll know the exact moment. It's like salvation. It's like being born again. When is a person born again? When he comes down an aisle and signs a card? What specific? You may have grown up in a Christian home and belatedly come to know Christ the Savior, and you don't know exactly, but there is a time when you were not saved and were saved. When does marriage happen? It's when you and your wife together join.